Kia ora koutou. No mai haere mai ki tēnei wānanga. Ko Caitlin Carew aho. No te awa kairangi aho. Ke kia manawaroa ngā ākina o te ao tūraua aho e mahi ana. He kai hautu whakapā aho. Kia ora I'm Caitlin Carew. I'm the Senior Science Communications Advisor for the Resilience National Science Challenge. Welcome to today's webinar on the Kopapa Social Vulnerability and Disasters, looking at who is being left out of our efforts to prepare for disasters and how we can address these gaps. Thank you for joining us. It's really great to have you here. We'll be hearing about really interesting and important work being led by Dr. Denise Blake of Te Heringa Waka Victoria University of Wellington, Dr. Shiloh Groot of the University of Auckland, and their team of students who will be meeting shortly. I'll begin with our Resilience Challenge Karakia, Fiti Ora, and then I'll touch on a few housekeeping notes and then hand over to the research team. Kimi hia te pō rangahaua te ao, kia e o rangi, kia e o whenua, kei ngā mata o te araki, kei mata nuku, kei mata rangi, kei rera koe e tane te wai ora, ko ngā maungaru, ko ngā awa para whenua, hera uta ki tai, kia tangaroa e, ko koe, ko au, ko tauwane, fiti ao, fiti, fiti ora, are mai te toki, Homie, huie, taiaki. So, in terms of housekeeping, I'll start by mentioning that today's webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes, which is a little bit longer than our usual one hour format. So, we'll be going through till about 12.30 to allow enough time for the presentations and a fulsome QA discussion. We'll be moving into questions at about midday. I hope you can stay for the whole time, but if not, we are recording the session. So in the next day or two, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording on our YouTube channel. So if you have colleagues who couldn't make it today, please do share that with them. The Q&A uh, will function through uh, the Q&A box, um, which you should see um, up top there. Please do pop questions in as you think of them. So we have a few questions ready to get stuck into. I'll hand over now to Dr. Shiloh Groot, Senior Lecturer in the School of Psychology at the University of Auckland, to introduce the kaupapa and the rest of the team. Ngā mihi ki a koe, Shiloh. Ngā mihi, Caitlin, e ngā mihi ki a koutou. Um, we are a team of researchers, as Caitlin mentioned, that are led by myself at um, the University of Auckland and Denise Blake at uh, University of Victoria. So we're investigating the impacts of disasters on vulnerable lives. This includes low socioeconomic renters or precarious renters, migrant communities, people who inject, inject drugs, and homeless people, homelessness across the spectrum. So in each of our talks, uh, I guess I gave it away a little bit with the rabbit ears, but in each of our talks, in our own ways, we will problematize terminology, terminology like social vulnerabilities, which can lead to government ineffectiveness, uh, competition between agencies for funding, diminish mana for communities, and paternalistic responses. So in effect, these social inequities are reproduced not only at these personal levels or at the individualistic level or at the individual level, but for entire communities is a shared experience that can define the service landscape for them. So as Caitlin also mentioned, we'll be exploring what are these impacts then for communities? How and why have they been left out of our disaster risk reduction efforts? And how might we address these gaps in a way that enhances mana and the integrity of our research and our responses? And we do this in work in response to the National Science Challenges Resilience to Nature's Challenge. So we're in effect seeking to deepen human resilience to natural hazards, and we cannot do so by assuming this one-size-fits-all approach or by denying how deeply embedded social inequities are. But that, I am not the star of this presentation. I will hand it over to our actual first star, which would be V. Oh, no, sorry, Mel. 
you almost got to go second, but no, you get to go first. Who is doing her masters is an amazing and talented master's student who will talk a bit about her work with most socioeconomic students and their experiences renting while trying to prepare for earthquakes. Over to you, Mel. Can you see my slides now? Yep, yeah, awesome. Yeah, so um, kia ora, my name is Melanie Roundell and I'm studying my Masters of Health Psychology at Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, so my thesis is aiming to identify what the key barriers are that prevent earthquake preparation in low income students who rent in Wellington City and identify ways to reduce these barriers to improve the rate of earthquake preparation. Um, to do this, I've conducted eight interviews with low income students who each brought in photos of their experiences of living in Wellington City and with their earthquake preparation. Um, so I've used these photos throughout my presentation just to understand why this research is important. Um, firstly, we're just going to go over what it is like to be a low income student and the role that living in Wellington City plays in this. Um, so low income renting students are part of three groups that often experience social exclusion, which is when an individual does not have the same access to privileges and opportunities as everyone else. So if an individual is part of multiple groups, this um, social exclusion intersects to form a unique convergence of disadvantages specific to that individual. So in the event of a disaster, such as an earthquake, the social exclusion can lead to social vulnerability in which an already disadvantaged group is disproportionately impacted by disasters and likely to experience more negative implications. So it's clear throughout the research that low income individuals struggle to afford day to day supplies, are unable to afford to purchase their own home and often have to go without necessities to be able to afford rent. Furthermore, those who rent are often subjected to housing instability and insecurity as how long they live in their house is dependent on the landlord, as well as being constrained by many of the renting rules, whether these are legal regulations or the landlord's decisions. Additionally, those who are new to renting, such as students, may not be aware of their renting rights and therefore, oops, sorry, um, and therefore uh, struggle to stand up to their landlords in a conflict. Um, students are often experience income constraints due to their studies and often have to find cheap places to rent, which, as the recent media has reflected, is usually mouldy, damp and cold. So why is Wellington City important in this research? So roughly 25% of Wellington City is full time students, with the majority of them renting. Due to the housing shortage, this cost of renting has risen and global policy suggests that renters should be paying less than 30% of their income on rent, yet students in Aotearoa are on average spending 52%. You'd expect that paying more than 200 a week on a single room in a shared flat would mean that you would have a house which meets the healthy home standards, um, yet many of the students' rentals remain mouldy, damp, uninsulated and with poor heating options. Um, research shows that many low income renters have accepted renting this poor housing as it's all that they can afford and they also have concerns about complaining as they are at risk then of being evicted or having their rent increased to a point that is unsustainable. So consequently, many low income students are subjected to high rent and unhealthy houses. So alongside this high cost of living, as many of us know, residents are at risk of a large overdue earthquake centred on the Wellington fault line. Alongside Wellington City being earthquake prone, it is also risk of many cascading disasters such as tsunamis, landslides, liquefaction, bursting water mains and large building fires. So the main concern in my study is the potential for an earthquake to trigger landslides that block State Highway 1 and 2, which is the only access in and out of Wellington City. This would cause Wellington City residents to be stranded until the route is re-established, which is predicted to take 10 weeks. So consequently, residents may be left isolated with limited food and water and medical supplies and any injured residents are unlikely to receive aid in a timely manner. This likelihood of potential damage in an earthquake and the cascading disasters could cause um, would be more detrimental if the residents were ill prepared for an earthquake. So to encourage more earthquake preparation, first we need to understand the barriers of why some of these residents may be not unprepared. So in my research, I have split um, earthquake preparation into two sections. So the first is the survival enhancing, which involves um, storing water, cooking supplies and medical supplies um, to be used following an earthquake. 
Um, however, the current research shows that there are significant barriers to enhancing survival due to the insufficient funds to purchase supplies, a lack of space to store them, a lack of edu education, and most importantly, a lack of support to be more prepared. Um, the second type of my earthquake preparation is disaster mitigation, which involves actions such as fastening um, furniture to walls, retrofitting the house. Um, current research shows that these actions can often be costly, and many of those who rent are unable to secure furniture to the walls due to having concerns that they'll have to use their bond to repay damage they may cause, um, and any structural damage is um, they're liable for. So any large structural changes that is the landlord's responsibility and not something that the renters can take upon themselves to do to make their home safer. So if we put all of this together, um, it kind of highlights that low income students who rent in Wellington City are likely to live in substandard houses that aren't meeting the healthy home standards, have little extra income to be able to afford unexpected costs. So consequently, they're unable to afford to be able to prepare for an earthquake, may not have the space to store items or the knowledge and skills to be able to prepare. And this means that they're likely that in the event of an earthquake, they'll be disproportionately impacted. Um, so this leads me to my research. As I mentioned before, I conducted eight interviews in which participants brought in photos they had already taken of their living situation and the earth, their earthquake preparation or the lack thereof for most of them. Um, sadly, I don't have time to go over all of my preliminary findings, but I can share two key findings in regard to the reality of renting as low income students and one of the key barriers that this group faces in regard to earthquake preparation. So on the screen are some photos um, my participants shared in regard to the current housing situation. So for the first photo there, it shows a participant who, despite being celiac, had to eat gluten food as she's unable to afford the gluten free food. Um, a participant whose house had cracks down the wall, which the landlord wasn't interested in doing anything about. A participant whose house was so cold and damp, the only place to dry their clothes was right next to the heater. And a participant who had rats living in her walls. So it was clear throughout all these interviews that the, most of the participants had normalised the idea of living in mouldy, damp, cold, uninsulated and expensive houses, as they found that as a student, this is just what was expected by them. This was discussed by Lily, who said, I think as a student, like, I just have this expectation that my flat's going to be shit. It's just expected to have a bad flat, so it doesn't really bother me too much. I'd love like a clean, warm, cosy environment, but you get home and you get into your bed and you're just shivering. So regarding earthquake preparation, all participants admitted to not having anything prepared and instead opted to share what they felt they might use following an earthquake. As depicted in the first photo, one participant discussed having access to her pantry, although she had concerns that all the food in there required cooking and she had no way to cook it. The middle photo showed an emergency kit that was provided when one participant moved into her flat at the start of the year. Uh, it is covered in mould and all the supplies expired in 2018. The third photo shows the um, entirety of one participant's storage space, which she is quite clearly unable to store further items in. So, oops, sorry. Every participated, uh, participant indicated that income was a barrier to preparing, and that preparing for an event that may or may not happen isn't something they can feasibly afford on top of their rent, the cost of day-to-day -day supplies, and the rising cost of living in Wellington City. This caused many participants to be avoidant towards earthquake concerns as they felt it was easier to deal with than um, just by not thinking about it. So such as Alexandra who says, I have a list of priorities in my life and earthquakes are on top. It's sort of like, I know I'm going to have to do that next week and I know that I have to pay that bill and I know that my insurance is due next month, but I don't know there'll be an earthquake, you know. If I wasn't a student, like I would prepare, but like obviously I can't because of my income and I'm flooding, I just physically can't do it. Um, so my other preliminary findings have identified that although income plays a large role in earthquake preparedness, many participants also felt restricted by the renting regulations. They suffered from a lack of space to store prepared items. They were newly independent and unaware of what was required in earthquake preparation. And there was a very strong she'll be right mantra. So my next step after this is suggest some ways to mitigate these barriers for low income students renting in Wellington City, which will aim to increase the likelihood of being earthquake prepared and therefore reduce their social vulnerability and the disproportionate impacts they're likely to experience following an earthquake in Wellington City. Um, thank you for listening to my presentation. I've really enjoyed the research into the disaster space and hope to continue this research into my PhD next year. Um, if you have any further questions or like any of my sources, please feel free to email me or one of my supervisors. Thank you. Many thanks, Mel.
uh, I, I love the strength of the mes message that how the parasitic behaviors of say landlords and how that intersects with something like um, earthquake preparedness and how that comes at a human cost. I think that's a really profound message in a pertinent issue in Aotearoa at the moment or has been for some time. So moving on to our next amazing star, if we will keep up the theme of stars, our next amazing star, uh, a master's student in health psychology as well, uh, V. Hint, hint. Thank you, Shiloh. I'm just gonna use two minutes. Um... Can you just see my slide? Cool, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction, Shiloh. Um, kia ora, I'm V. Um, I'm a master thesis student um, at um, Te Heranga Waka. Um, and I'm supervised, I'm co-supervised by Denise and Shiloh. My thesis um, focused on disaster preparedness of Vietnamese migrants living in Wellington. Um, I was interested in this topic because I noticed that um, there was little representation of um, Asian migrants in general, but also um, Vietnamese migrants in particular in um, disaster research. When they are represented, um, their experiences are portrayed in a homogenized way or um, they might be taken out of context. Um, and uh, I've been interested in contextualizing um, people's health related experiences and outcomes. So I thought I, would, I apply that um, interest and approach to this topic as well. Um, so to talk a bit more about what I've done for the thesis, um, I've looked at the literature and so far these are the um, some of the important factors that I found, um, including social capital, um, cultural and ethnic char um, characteristics, discrimination based on language ability, past experiences of um, adversity. Um, they've been identified as um, important determinants of or correlates with um, disaster preparedness in Vietnamese migrants. Um, and I acknowledge that these um, these elements or factors are important. Um, they're important to know, but um, I want to introduce a different angle of looking at them by contextualizing people's experiences. Um, and when I talk about contextualizing, um, one of the way to do that is to look at certain contextual conditions, um, multiple of them um, at once. For example, some important um, contextual conditions I'm interested in for this um, project is um, the context of modernized Vietnam, because most of my participants came from a modernized Vietnam. And because um, when I refer to Vietnam, other people who might not come from there would think of it as a socialist or poor country. Um, that might be a part of the picture, but the big, the bigger picture has um, more nuances than that. Because um, some people have already pointed out that neoliberal capitalism and also modern development have been um, really strongly influencing the social and economic policies and also the mainstream culture. Um, and to focus on the Aotearoa context, um, we can consider the political economy or the um, neoliberal capitalism that resulted in high rates of immigration from Asian countries, including Vietnam, um, especially since um, the 80s. Um, and zooming out a bit, we can also look at the global context, so that means the development framework um, is the framework that position countries into a hierarchy of development. Um, so classifying countries into developed, developed or developing um, countries. So in this case, um, my participants would be framed to come from um, Vietnam, a developing country, to Aotearoa, a developed country. Um, it's important to consider these contextual conditions, especially the one um, around the global context in Aotearoa, because they have important implications for um, immigration policies and also um, Oh, and the immigra immigration policies would determine migrants' um, rights and access to resources. And also, just mm, in an important way, the public attitudes towards um, migrants. Um, before I get to the ontology and methodology, I just emphasize that I don't aim to present rep representational accounts of Vietnamese migrants um, through this project, because um, I want to acknowledge that they and their 
experiences are very diverse and different. Um, so this research is situated in critical realism, um, mainly because it offers a really useful framework to focus um, on the context of people's experiences. In terms of theory, I refer to narrative theory. Um, within this theory, people we think of um, we think that people make sense of their experiences through stories, stories that they tell other people or they are told by other people. Um, so people would create personal narratives to make sense of their own personal experience. Um, but people live in a very social world, so there are also stories that are available at other social levels, like community, um, cultural collective, um, and also just society broadly. And people can have access to different kinds of narratives um, from different levels, depending on their background. Um, sorry. Um, that's the reason why I refer to levels of narrative analysis to analyze people's narrative accounts, because it um, it allows me to look at people's narratives at multiple levels across those levels um, simultaneously, like personal, interpersonal, positional, um, ideological, and so on. Um, I'm still in the process of analyzing people's narratives, but here are some short examples to show how I interpret them. So this first example demonstrates how a person experienced um, one, one the first earthquake that they went through when they were here. Um, so this was from um, this was a story that someone told when they um, were experiencing um, experiencing an earthquake when they were at a friend's house. So when they felt the shaking, they're like, um, "Why is your house shaking? How's this can't just shake, right?" So um, through that. I can see that, um, or the way I would make sense of it is that it suggests that they didn't have immediate access to um, the story or the knowledge about the um, earthquake or the environment context to make sense of their experience at that point. Um, but also from the positional um, level through that story, they sort of frame or position themselves as the recent migrant in that story. So they didn't have immediate access to um, narrative about the environmental context, as I said. Another part, another question that um, we can ask here is that why is it that when they came to the country, they were already aware that earthquakes are a common thing, so they know that, but when they first experienced it, they didn't um, sort of make that link right, at, right, right away. Um, so we can zoom out from this narrative and look at some, some of the contextual um, elements. So first of all, people came from um, modernized Vietnam, but it's still like a different um, environmental context. So people didn't, people don't really experience earthquakes in Vietnam. So we are not familiar enough with it to um, make sense of it right away when we experience it. Um, second, we can also think about the context of Aotearoa that is underpinned by the neoliberal politics, um, where migrants are expected to become knowledgeable or become familiar with the environmental context right away on them uh, by themselves. So there's little support uh, for them to um, acquire knowledge or become familiar with the environment. Also to apply the uh, to apply the lens of the global context, we can think about the um, power relations between develop developing and developed countries. Um, because um, they're they're framed as migrants who move from who voluntary volu voluntarily move from a developing to a developed countries to seek better opportunities and living conditions. Um, so it's framed as a choice. That's why the responsibility to become a savvy, um, knowledgeable and prepared resident is on them. Um, there are also other examples about how people prepare for disasters or make sense of their engagement with disaster risk reduction. So when um, I interviewed this person about how they engage with disaster risk reduction, um, they, says, they said this, um, as I live overseas, I need to know how to take care of myself. So this is linked to the previous example about um, the context that is underpinned by neoliberal politics. Um, it can also be understood from the personal and positional level. So when people tell this narrative, they um, tell the story about a um, independent migrant, right? So good migrant um, identity and role. 
because they're living in a context where there are um, negative implications if they're viewed as a bad migrant. Um, another story um, goes like this. From a consumer's perspective, uh, preparedness items don't fit in well with my daily routine, so buying them is not my priority. Um, so even though we think of well, people within research, for example, think of um, preparedness items as something that's really essential to survival, and we try to tell people that. Uh, but in this person's story, is framed preparedness items are framed as um, just consumer goods, so just like any other products on the market that were um, sold. So at the social level, this narrative reflects the consumer capitalist context where everything is commodified pretty much or consider a product to be sold. Um, and people are often conditioned to um, consume quite excessively. But at the same time, their consumption is framed to be simply based on their demand. So in their story, if they see no demand for preparedness items or prioritize the competing demands or other commodities, they're not likely to buy them, even though the items, they might know that the items are um, important to their survival in case of disasters. Um, so that context might um, reflect the context of Aotearoa, but also the modernized Vietnam, like I said, or maybe a bit of both. Um, so those are some examples, and hopefully they provide the clearer ideas about what I meant when I said I, um, I aim to contextualize Vietnamese migrants' experience um, in disaster. And also, I um, I forgot to explain that when I said developed in developing countries, I'm aware that it's a um, framework or hierarchy that has been problematized. Um, and the language used that is common nowadays is global north or global south, or low income or high income. But the consequence of the development framework is still um, very um, important and prevalent. So that's why I just bring attention to that. Here are my references. Thanks so much for your attention. Many thanks, V. Uh, I loved hearing about your findings. I've been eagerly waiting to hear about them. And thank you for sharing the experiences of how differently socially positioned groups, such as migrant communities living in uh, Aotearoa, can impact also their ability to prepare for disasters. I'm not sure if I've just frozen. Have I frozen? I think a little bit. Okay, have I just unfrozen, I take it? Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> I will move on to Denise, who is presenting on behalf of Anya, but thank you again, B, for sharing your talk and your findings. Kia ora. Thanks, Shiloh. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, V. So today I have the honour of presenting Anna Renek's master's research on people who inject drugs, also known as PWITs, and their access to harm reduction services during disaster. So Anna was unable to present today as she's recently moved to Australia to take up a two-year psychology internship internship at a psychology clinic. Um, she does send her regards to everyone here and everyone in the emergency management sector. So during this presentation, I'll give you a very background to needle exchange programs. I'll talk about the research context that Anya um, was embedded in, but I'll predominantly focus on her key findings. So these are the personal and social influences of what hinders and enables preparedness actions for this community. So during the discussion of the findings, I'll um, present participants quotes, they'll be interspersed during the, during the discussion. So firstly, however, Anya and I would like to acknowledge Chris Burr. So this project and access to needle exchange in Nelson came about because Chris contacted me in 2018, saying he was worried about access to drug using equipment for peewids on the west coast of the South Island due to the frequent and excessive flooding they were experiencing down there. Chris wanted to make sure that people who used his service could continue to ex access the health enhancing equipment that needle exchanges provide. As a long-time supporter of harm reduction services, I was able to take some of our RNC resources to support Anne to do her master's project. So in this way, Anne was able to do a thesis 
that had real lived effects. It was driven by the PWID community for the PWID community and was just the conduit. So Chris was pivotal to every part of this research. He skillfully mentored Anne, he met with me frequently, and he provided rich and insightful guidance into his community. So the team at Needle Exchange are devastated in trying to adjust to the loss of Chris, who passed away in August of this year after a short illness. More Maira, Chris. So Chris and his team work for NISH, the Nelson Injecting um, Community Hub Enterprise. So NISH is a needle exchange program that provides important harm reduction services for PWIDs so they can access new and clean, and clean injecting drug equipment and seek advice or information for safe drug use. This is all enabled to, to enable them to prevent um, them from reusing um, equipment or sharing equipment and thus avoiding blood-borne to the viruses or other physical harms. So people can also return their used equipment to a needle exchange service so that they're disposed of safely. Needle exchange programs are predominantly peer led and as such offer a range of services, particularly psychosocial services. So making them an empowering and judgment free space for people to go along to and get support and clean eject equipment. NEPs are one of the most successful harm reduction services that we've seen in the alcohol and other drugs space over the last number of uh, well, over the last few years. So they've helped prevent the spread of HIV and hepatitis C. So this is just a photo of some of the equipment up the photo one that's the range of equipment they supply. You'll see in photo two a micron filter. So these filters are used to take the impurities out of substances, dirt, debris, or syrup. From, so when people inject them, they, they aren't um, subject to additional harms. And down the bottom, picture three and four are just photos of some of the um, needles and syringes they can purchase. So we've heard, we've heard from Mal, we've heard from V, and we all know that disasters can neg negatively affect access to health services and people's wellbeing. But not all people are affected the same. We get that, yeah? So often people with little resources experience increased or exaggerated disaster harms and disadvantage. So this, ex this research explored what hinders and enables accessibility to needle exchange programs on the west coast of the South Island in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Once a month, Chris or Niche, the service, would take a van down to the west coast of the South Island, it was a mobile outreach service, to um, service the PWID, so to d disseminate, to hand out equipment and so forth. Um, they, the, the, the PWIDs that live on the west coast can buy needles and syringes from the local or the participating pharmacies, um, but it's a different type of service, as you can imagine. So Anne's research was qualitative in that she interviewed 14 PWIDs who lived between Westport and Greymouth. She used interpretive phenomenological analysis, which meant that she was able to do a deep dive examination of their lived experiences according to their accounts on their terms. So IPA attempts to avoid any pre-existing theoretical preconceptions, but does recognize that research in and of itself is an interpretive endeavor. Um, and that who we are as people are sense-making organisms. So it gullies all of that. Um, Anne also conducted some follow-up interviews with seven people after the 2021 floods on the West Coast. So here's an image of the floods in Westport, the effects in Westport in July 2021. The torrential rainstorm at that point caused parts of the Westport region to exceed over 690 millimetres of rain in under 72 hours. So most of us on here will remember, remember that time. It was an amount that typically would be expected over a month. So there was huge effects and a number of houses became inhabitable. Okay, the findings. So in summary, the findings demonstrated how social vulnerability for people who inject drugs is upheld and reinforced by a complex network of psychological, social and structural mechanisms. We always have to be thinking about that. So Anna found that we are able to identify um, personal and psychological influences on the accessibility to clean drug and using equipment. So the issues that hindered access and ultimate resilience included lifestyle, so substance dependency, 
So lifestyle, stigma, all of the things that are involved when you have an active drug dependency. So some of this overshadowed people's desires or even their perceived need to access any type of health service or engage in any health preserving behaviours such as seeking shelter in an emergency. So what this did was impact on their internal motivation, the, foreseeing the need to prepare. Um, also key to this community, as with any community, and we've heard Melanie just talk about this, is financial resources. So to be prepared, PWIDs need to be able to buy drug using equipment in advance ahead of time to put in their kit. So a lot of the PWIDs in this research talked about that being limited, and here's an example. So one person talked about barriers to the cost of buying drug injecting equipment. So even though it's highly subsidised, um, one or two, three, four dollars is a lot of money um, for people in there and often in this position. So the following quote highlights how somebody did have insurance, household insurance, but decided to get rid of it because $23 per week doesn't sound like much, but for me, that's four, two litres of milk and a couple of loaves of bread. So $23 a week that might have covered insurance was a lot of money in this case. Okay, and uh, also found things that enabled resilience. So, um, so people in the research also talked about being motivated to prepare um, for a disaster because they they lived the effects of the importance of having clean equipment and avoiding the physical harms, especially when they were geographically isolated, which is the case on the West Coast. So they talked a lot about the impact of having hepatitis C, some of them already had it, or being sick from having a dirty hit or an unclean drug, drug injection. Um, it's not very pleasant. So PWIDs um, also had a lot of internal resilience, and this is the thing that we forget about. The, the lifestyle of an active person who uses drugs um, is pretty chaotic at times. And so it involves always finding ways and means to access drugs, to use the drugs. So that means these people are incredibly resilient. They know how to find things. They know how to do things. They're incredibly smart and resourceful people. So for them, this notion of bouncing back was a walking away. They talked about having done it before. I can walk away. If my house is destroyed or the flooding gets everything, it's okay to walk away. And here's an example of that. We lose our contents often throughout life and they laugh. We sell them. We leave them in houses when we move on because we have to move on because we owe money or whatever it is. So, you know, there's not that same attachment to things like um, other people might have. So Anna looked at the social influences on resilience, and these are also quite prominent. Um, some of the hindrances, some of the, the um, things that got in the way of actually being able to be resilient, prepare, or even think about recovering were where to go, like housing, homes, that sort of thing. A lot of people talked about being able, unable to go to families' homes or staying with friends because relationships have already been fractured. Um, due to the drug using history and some of the behaviours that happened around that. Key to this research and a lot of research in the PWID space is stigma. Stigma is huge. So people felt like they would not get the same support as others, um, which is incredibly problematic. They felt the ones that had been in welfare hubs had felt stigma in those hubs or felt stigma or judged by the officials in those positions. Also difficult was trying to navigate the different types of social support. So I think a lot of us take that for granted. And there's a couple of really good quotes that highlight this. So the first one said, I was out there and I was going from one place and they would go, no, you need to go over there. And I just felt like I was getting pushed and pulled. So they were actually trying to get some accommodation after a flood, but they were just getting pushed from pillar to post because often people from these communities, the services don't want to deal with them for whatever reason, and it's mostly stigma. Um, also, we need to remember the access to online services. So this person was like, oh, they just say go online. Well, not everybody goes online. You know, I don't even have, um, know how to use the internet. And in the disaster space, we're talking a lot about apps and, you know, listening to the radio, all those things. And, and some of these communities don't do that. Okay, social influences. They also included what enabled resilience. 
And so one of the key things in this research was peers supporting peers, which is the whole co-papa, the whole facado behind needle exchange services. So peers in the drug using community talked about supporting each other with accessing drugs to stop people from going into withdrawals and to get injecting supplies. Really awesome social support, social capital inside of that um, community. So positive relations and camaraderie meant people supported one another. So in summary, to restate some of the key ideas that came out of our Anna's research was social stigma is a commonly cited barrier to healthcare access for people who inject drugs, including here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So a whole lot of previous research has shown that and Anna also found that. Minoritized groups in Aotearoa, New Zealand are often not included with preparedness practices. And we've just talked about that. We've heard V talk about that um, in, in terms of our um, Vietnamese whānau, you know, like we're not adjusting to the specific needs of our communities. So PWIDs are likely to face a lack of need specific representation and preparedness messaging. What does all this mean? So for Anna, this study supports the need for our children in New Zealand to move towards needs-based emergency management to prioritise the well-being of those more vulnerable to disaster harms and injustice. Not that they're vulnerable, but the accessibility to what they need to be able to survive and survive well is vulnerable. So accessing safe equipment in disaster situations requires PWIDs to adopt preparedness and proactive behaviours to be able to access psychosocial support from peers and from the exchange programs and to be, to be embedded in a resilience and social environments and infrastructures. So I just want to now mahi to Anne, but we also want to dedicate this presentation to Chris from the Nelson Neil Exchange Service. Kia ora koutou. Awesome. Many thanks, Denise. I loved how you asserted that when one of the issues with defining entire communities and the experience under the label of vulnerability is we do so with little recourse to their own understandings, strengths and capacities. And our Hello. final speaker of this of our panel, I will move on to Tycho from the University of Auckland. Uh, thank you. Um... Hopefully this is showing okay. I've noticed that I've lost everyone else's video. So if at any stage my video or uh, voice drops out, just interrupt me um, because I have no idea. I can't really see what's going on. Um, but yeah, so um, my background actually isn't in disasters. I come from community psychology and I think that's been quite interesting in that it's given me a different foundation on how I have come into the space or even um, understand these topics, or it even pointed out the fact that actually this was a big missing area in my knowledge and my practice and that prior to being invited into the space by Shiloh and Denise, I hadn't really thought much about disasters, both in my research and even in my personal life. Um, so that's kind of set me up to be a little bit different than say some people who might come through into disasters from other fields. Um, and my kind of talk today will be slightly divergent from the others and that I'm not really drawing on any empirical data. Instead, I'm going to be considering how we do this kind of research into STASA studies and produce new knowledge. And also, hopefully this is more or less just a invitation for critical reflection about how you do research or practice or how you engage in a disaster space. Um, and given I've only got around 10 minutes, potentially less, um, I will be touching on some big ideas. So if there's anything that I kind of skim over, then I definitely suggest using the Q&A or even emailing me afterwards if we don't have time to cover it in this corridor today. Um, so very briefly, consistent across our work so far has been that we are working with minoritized and marginalized populations um, or communities. And the reason why we use this language of minoritized or marginalized is that we're moving away from the idea that these groups are inherently marginal and rather that they've been rendered as such through social processes and structures and systems which push them to the margins of society. Um, and on top of that, that we're dealing with people who often have intersecting marginalized identities. 
Um, so obviously people are very complex and they're quite likely to be experiencing marginalization or oppression from across a range of different social positionings or identities that they hold. So that's just like a outline of why we're using that kind of language. Um, my sort of focus area is in the realm of homelessness and prior to doing uh, well, the first task I've sort of undertaken in working in this space is doing a literature review in terms of how has the disaster scholarship accounted for homeless people um, within their work. And I found that over the course of about the last 30 or 40 years, I could only find, I think, just under 60 documents, so peer-reviewed articles, um, student work, things like that, that actually focused on people who were homeless um, prior to a disaster striking. Um, and so our knowledge is very marginal at this point. Um, and I will say that overall, um, it is apparent and it's probably quite obvious that disasters have a disproportionate impact on people who are experiencing homelessness. So there are higher risks of morbidity and mortality. And so this is an urgent area that we actually need to account for. And this is because of things such as homeless people being often living in more exposed areas. They're quite literally pushed to the margins of society in terms of what kind of spatial um, areas they exist in. Um, they don't have the adequate means to prepare for disaster, as kind of Denise touched upon. A lot of the things that we take for granted as needing to accumulate to prepare cost money that might seem like a small amount for some of us, but actually is simply unobtainable for other people. Um, and in terms of that, there are also structural barriers regarding what kind of access they have to support services during or after a disaster event. Um, so a lot of the times people might not be able to access a disaster shelter because there aren't evacuation services that account for them. So things like uh, trains or buses might be disrupted during a disaster event and because they don't know or are unlikely to own a car, they can't make it to an evacuation service. Um, in the United States, I also found some kind of horrific cases whereby perhaps they made it to an evacuation shelter, but then homeless people were forced to wear things like yellow bands and separated from the general population um, as due to things like stigma and the perception that they're going to be disruptive in that space or somehow be harmful to other people using that service. So again, this stuff sort of runs quite deeply throughout their experiences within a disaster. And because of that, a lot of homeless people are also reluctant to even engage with these services. Um, for instance, if we're relying on police or emergency services to relay information about a disaster or to coordinate evacuation services, some homeless people may not want to engage with them and actively avoid their presence due to things like previous experiences of criminalization. Um, and as I've kind of touched on, the majority of literature and information we do have is from the United States, and also most of it pertains to rough sleeping. So there isn't a lot of work that's touched on how people who are couch surfing or living in dilapidated buildings, that kind of thing, experience disaster. And what I found also is that despite being flagged as a vulnerable population, they're otherwise rendered invisible in many key texts. Um, the Sendai framework doesn't really have any regard for them. And I did a brief look through a lot of local policy in New Zealand and there are also no sort of, um, nothing that I could see that speaks specifically to homeless people or precariat people. So again, while we know that they're incredibly likely to experience higher morbidity and mortality, there's nothing really out there that's preventing that from happening. And just briefly, because we're talking about vulnerability, I did want to just also problematize this concept because it has become a little bit mainstream and sometimes we don't fully consider how we engage with these kind of concepts. Um, and as scholars and practitioners in this space, we kind of need to be aware of how these sort of concepts can actually perpetuate myths or ideas or practices, which actually in turn undermine our very work within the space of disaster risk reduction. So for instance, um, a lot of scholars are now pointing out that most vulnerability approaches we draw on tend to privilege Western science over other ways of seeing and being, and that contributes to this Western 
hegemony within disaster research and thus our practice. Um, in doing so, um, and when it's used uncritically, vulnerability might actually render certain places and people as being unstable, incompetent, indisposed, so essentially labelling them as a problem that needs to be fixed or worked on. And there are cases now where people are pointing to how governments or certain social forces can actually adopt this notion of vulnerability to justify interventions that actually through the marginalised, displaced and dispossessed people. So I know that, for instance, in Manila, um, where there's quite a great urban flood risk, the notion of building back better has actually been used to justify the eviction of poorer communities from spaces where they kind of want to cleanse away poverty and that kind of thing. And so again, um, similar cases in the United States where after a disaster, public housing which was damaged has been demolished and then replaced with private housing, thus removing that um, social safety net for precarious communities. And oftentimes it's mobilized in that way whereby a community is somehow marked as other and a way we can get rid of them is by using sort of disaster risk or mitigation practices. And it also actually affects how we as scholars engage with these communities and also how they engage with us. But I would argue that it's not a lost cause um, because the concept of vulnerability does speak across so many disciplines, it would be wrong to simply get rid of it or labeling it as purely a problematic concept. Rather, I think we have to think more carefully about how we operationalize and conceptualize it. So coming through the literature now slowly is this idea of relational vulnerability, which sort of understands and accounts for the ways in which marginalized people are adversely incorporated into political, social and economic relationships that produce their vulnerability while simultaneously creating relative security for other people. In a way, I think we can also get through this is by this idea of interrupting the field, interrupting the field, uh, uh, the space of disaster studies. And to do that isn't so much to just be like, no, what we're doing is bad, let's get rid of it. It's about bringing in new perceptions uh, and different ideas from other perhaps uh, disciplines or spaces which traditionally have been left out of disaster studies. And one of them I think which will um, produce a lot of knowledge which will help us account for some of these problems that we're encountering is environmental justice. And environmental justice delves more deeply into the complex ways that multiple forms of oppression create, shape and re reproduce one another. So it gets to the root reason of why certain communities are marginalized in the first place. And also indigenous environmental justice offers us a model through which we can actually frame issues in terms of their colonial origins while also affirming decolonization frameworks. And another thing it does is it also forces us to reconsider what justice in the context of disaster looks like. So an Aotearoa that should align with Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And so if we were looking at homelessness and disasters through this environmental justice lens, it would force us to ask questions such as, what historical, political and social processes might be pushing homeless people to live in hazard prone areas in the first place? It's not by chance that they've ended up living in these kind of situations. Obviously, there's something deeper going on there. Um, for instance, are there city ordinances which are pushing people out of urban spaces and into these more um, hazard prone areas such as on a riverbank? How might our efforts in disaster risk reduction actually further displace and dispossess homeless people? So again, if we were to move this community or this encampment off the riverbank under the guise of uh, disaster risk reduction, where and how could we actually be doing that in a way where it further pushes them from away from society, further pushes them away from necessarily social services, that kind of thing. So it makes us look both um, before and after a disaster, it makes us look at those kind of processes a little bit more in depth. So to bridge these approaches, 
Um, I draw on things like uh, relational ethics, whereby we're working with communities, not on these communities. Um, centralizing frenetic knowledge, which is knowledge of lived experience, so actually positioning homeless people as experts in their own lives. And obviously an explicit commitment to titiriti and in pursuit of mana motuhaki. And our focus then should be on transforming these systems rather than just having a band-aid ready to support these communities after the disaster. We should be questioning why homelessness or these other social marginalizations exist in the first place. And just going forward or the next chapter and what I will be doing in this space is hopefully um, doing a small study into how precariat trans and gender diverse people also engage with disaster risk reduction efforts. Just go through my references and then yeah, my email and stuff if you want to contact me or learn more about these things. Um, looks like it's not okay, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Taiko. Um, as a fellow community psychologist and homelessness researcher, yes, it has certainly been eye-opening of my own ignorance of in disaster spaces. Um, perhaps if I was to close for us, one of the things that uh, the things that is underlying uh, all of our talks that we haven't explicitly stated, but perhaps in Denise's acknowledgement of Chris's passing that might be apparent to everyone listening, is the relational ethics underlying our research. That these are communities that we're deeply engaged with, and that is a more genuine that offers us a genuine space for addressing societal vulnerabilities or the ways in which vulnerabilities are produced through social inequities. And I will close it off there and thank all my fellow presenters. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Shiloh, for that um, fabulous uh, facilitation. And thank you to all of our Kairangaho, our research team, for the excellent presentations. Um, I learned a lot and I hope you all did too. Um, so we can now move into um, questions and a bit of a panel discussion. Um, so I can see there are a couple of questions there in the um, Q&A panel. Please do populate it with your questions. Um, Shiloh, I'll ask you to perhaps facilitate um, those questions and direct them to the appropriate researcher. Can do. So I'm not sure if you can, how your computer's going, Taiko, but I can read out this one for you if you want. Okay. So there's a question that's been posed to you. Have you looked at in your the research or the literature review that you've done so far that follows the Australian bushfires for minoritized communities and they've started to do some amazing work looking forward if you wanted to talk to that? Um, yep, I've briefly looked at some of the work going on over there and um, I definitely think it aligns more with the crit critical disaster studies and starting to forge their understanding of, of um, again, a more preventative look at um, why these communities are minoritized in the first place and how to better account for them. Um, we're still falling into the trap of, um, I suppose, creating interventions or uh, uh, programs and stuff like that, which account for better supporting these communities when things like bushfires occur, but they're still not going quite as far as um, the broader picture of how can we prevent these people ending up in these situations of marginalization in the first place? Because I think actually, I think disaster studies, um, our goals are actually quite uh, coherent with some of the work we're doing in community psychology. At the end of the day, we are actually just trying to uplift humans and prevent ill harm and stuff like that. But I think there's this sort of missing component in disaster studies, which is at that preventative level. Um, but I do also acknowledge there's, there's a lot of work being done, particularly now with um, social geographers and others working in this space where we are trying to find, we're starting to find those um, good conversations across, but yeah, definitely acknowledge that the field is starting to shift and there's some great work being done uh, such as everyone else who's spoken today. <laughs> Thanks, Taiko. And since you can't see the Q&A very easily, I'll just say that 
to we had two comments here to direct it at Taiko and Mel, just congratulating you on a fantastic talk and interesting projects as well. So there's one another one more quest or another question that I can see that I could probably actually answer. Does the New Zealand Census questionnaire assist in locating or highlighting vulnerable groups? Uh, yes and no. It has it's limited. Uh, misses a lot, especially if we're thinking about homelessness. And attempts to uh, there was about 2014. There's a series of questions that were trying to capture whether or not homelessness or the preserve the prevalence of homelessness in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, some of those you're not going to necessarily get situations like overcrowding. It's going to be difficult to locate people. People go underground if they know they're about to be counted as well. So there's all sorts of situations that would make it really difficult to capture it because the census requires stability. And this is a group that's defined by transients and constant movement and reticence again in response to government agencies. So it has limited applicability, but it will highlight some of those vulnerabilities that minoritized groups will experience. Go to Charlotte, can I jump in as well? Because my my when I read that question, I was like, well, we know they exist. We know they're there. We they are highlighted every day, especially since COVID. So why would we continue to say we need to highlight this issue when actually we need to take action and either do the preventative stuff like Tycho's talking about, address the, the social power relations that construct these situations to begin with? Um, or work with them and go like, you know, Anna did with Chris, what do you need from us now? How can we help you move in a way that's best for you and your communities and the ways that you live your lives? So we don't need to highlight it. I think it's well highlighted. We are in a really precarious time with lots of working poor, you know, precarious communities, traditional poor communities coming through during this time. Kia ora. Yeah, so it's of limited utility in that sense mm -hmm. because we already know it exists. We already know these communities have been speaking about on these issues for what, almost 200 years now. There's, it's, we've got the evidence there, but it can be useful yep. in mobilising funding or mobilising, you know, which areas might be disproportionately um, experiencing different impacts. So it has some utility, but mm -hmm. we've got enough to go there. New comment that I can see. Yeah, I agree. So as Tycho's highlighted as well, homeless people and people who uh, inject drugs are often by nature resourceful because we, we found this a lot in the Christchurch earthquakes as well, that they were a lot of agencies were really concerned for homeless people that these were going to uh, trigger a whole bunch of traumas that they've already experienced and that they were going to fall apart essentially. But what they found is they were far more resilient than their middle class counterparts because their lives had been defined by so much difficulty and so much hardship. You, they just inherently respond in a way that encourages resilience. It's often our services and our responses that lack resiliency. And I guess this is what many of us have highlighted. Can I just touch on that one as well? Go for it. Um, I think absolutely acknowledging the strength and resourcefulness of these communities, but there's also the risk in further individualizing um, how we understand things like disaster risk reduction, um, or there's that risk of uh, how they build up their own uh, resilience to disaster from being co-opted from quite a neoliberal lens and then being mobilised in that way is that, well, if these communities are already resourceful, then why should we support them from that structural level? So I think it's quite a difficult space to kind of work within of simultaneously upholding that absolutely there's knowledge and capacities that exist within these communities, but also just being cautious about how we mobilise that and making sure that it's not actually used to, I guess, in some regards, further minoritise them. Um, because, yeah, in the homelessness literature, there's a little bit which speaks to how homeless people have come to understand things like weather patterns um, much more competently than most of the general public because they are out there often on the streets being exposed to these things or um, sometimes they're more aware of a um, problems in the environment prior to even someone from the local council or something like that being made aware of them. 
Um, but the problem is often they're reluctant to share that knowledge or engage with authorities because they're scared of being further criminalized or um, outing their spatial positions, that kind of thing. So I think this is one of those areas of tension which we need to work through a little bit more maybe. But yeah, that's just my two cents. <laughs> Agree. Even though we're focusing on natural hazards, COVID provides a really good exemplar in terms of the ineffectiveness of those responses and when we co-opt people's resilience. So homelessness and the response to that was, well, it was massive and amazing to see the country react and central government mobilise and, and house homeless people in motels. It also be, became a way in which a lot of people then washed their hands of the issue. It's resolved with housed people, they're no longer homeless. But what we're seeing now in media is the ways in which that has also been co-opted and we're seeing different groups co-opting resources. We're seeing uh, the ineffectiveness and that it hasn't really been a wraparound service and that many of, one, many of those situations have actually been made worse and undermined people's ability to flourish. I can't see any other questions. Jump in anyone else, sorry, if you want to say anything. I, think. I was just wondering if V or Mal want to add any other additional thoughts from their research, because we have a little bit of time and not so many questions, but there might be points that you want to expand on, that you've thought about, that you want to add as well. Um, yeah, just to add, I think that um, a lot of the current research is looking at one specific group and their one specific problem. So sort of when I was going through my literature review, there was a lot of, oh, this low income group can't prepare because they don't have money, which, yeah, correct. But they're not really thinking about all the other sort of implications that's coming that's causing that. So especially in my research, when you're looking at three groups and it's all this intersecting and all these different things that are playing, which is causing them to not be able to prepare for earthquakes. Um, I think that's sort of where research needs to start heading and understanding that it's sort of multi, like there's multiple things coming into it and you can't just identify one specific issue and try solve that issue and expect it all to be fixed. Everything needs to look at once, um, looked at at once and tackled at once rather than doing it individually and hoping that they'll solve it. Mm. Oh, I also Mel. want to add something now that Mel is talking about the financial difficulties. Because when I did interviews, uh, people really didn't mention fin financial difficulties, but they did mention the thing like the example I showed, uh, which is how how they perceive preparedness items in comparison to other demands or priorities. Um, because um, yeah, it might be a choice not to buy preparedness items. But that choice is like socialized within the context of um, consumer capitalist society. So mm -hmm. they're conditioned to buy other things, even though they might not need those things, or at least from our view. Um, so that's a different way to think about financial capacity or how it's actualized in people's life. I always really liked in your book, V, um, how you also highlighted I think this has also been in conversations and learned a lot from what you're doing as well, uh, the ways in which in dis when it comes to disaster responses, when we're trying to engage migrant groups, it might mean something surface or superficial like uh, language translation of resources, but that doesn't exactly, how do you reach those communities? How do you enhance responses to, if you are tying into church networks or something, then maybe you'd be able to have a much quicker and wider reach. So there's a little bit more than just these surface level responses that's required. And I really like the hidden group in your in your project, Melanie, the parasitic landlords, how something we, what we might feel that is disconnected from disaster preparedness, like uh, rent inflation, or healthy homes policy and how that's a fantastic idea, but it depends on tenants being able to go to the landlords and ask for changes to be made in order to be protected, have their lives protected in something like an earthquake. And that that is a scary and precarious place to be in for many young people. Also that it's an ongoing national joke, right? Part of being a student is living in, in a hovel and living off two minute noodles. And so it can make us as a community, as intersecting communities, less sympathetic to the need to ensure that students are able to survive and thrive. There was also, that's a really good point, Charlotte, because there was also the assumption that students, because they're at university, have resources. 
that a lot of them come from middle to upper class families. Um, so I was quite surprised at how many students Melanie actually got that are first time uh, family members at universities that are completely on scholarships that have that kind of deeper level of um, precariousness. Um, so I think that's really key too, Mel, that we can often apply those assumptions and overlook the specificities within those groups. Yeah. Cool research. To, sorry, you keep going. No, I, I guess tying it back to V's talk as well, that uh, that neoliberal ideology of individual responsibility means that we tend to position students as people who chose this. You chose yeah. to study. It's your personal choice. And therefore, yeah. you know, you should just put up with this. And it comes at a human cost. Mm. Yeah, good point. Occasionally, I'm sympathetic towards students, occasionally. <laughs> Is um, I just shaking their head, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just noticing, team, that there's a comment that says, Kia ora koutou, nā mahi for undertaking such important research. Just curious for these elements to these projects or other research that explores the relationships between these different vulnerabilities. So uh, if I can start responding to that, I did try, um, certainly within the precariat groups, precariat populations, communities, however you want to position them, there are similarities, but there's really clear differences. And I was really keen to do some research into looking at precariat groups as, as an assemblage within the disaster space. But as yet, I've not been able to get resources to do that. But I think it would be really cool to look at us and all of our different relevant communities across the boards, because there's a real these are real crossovers, like you were saying, Taiko, the intersectionalities with, you know, say our people people who do street sex work and the homelessness or migrants that come to New Zealand and have to stay underground when they do sex work and all of those complexities. Um, yeah, that would be cool. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, but it's certainly needed. I think it's inevitable in, lot, in everybody's work here in, that, in exploring that intersexual assemblage, the ways in which those the social is reproduced through those personal and at a shared mm. community level. I think it's it's inevitable in our work to acknowledge that, but uh, yeah, the, I think Denise's work or some of our work, joint work around sex work really does highlight the intersectionality. So the sex work community is just such a diverse community. You have got you have migrants with that. You have people from different backgrounds. You have you might have people who inject drugs. You might have people who have never taken drugs. So you can have so we. There are definitely ways in which we acknowledge that has different impacts within groups and across groups as well. Mm. I'm not sure if there's, that might be it, unless there's any more questions. I think there's one more there, Shiloh. My laptop is starting to have a breakdown. Do you want me to read it? It's more of a comment. Oh. Highlights, yeah. I guess that's also inherently interwoven into our approach. All of our all of our talks is the importance of social justice. And Tycho's definitely highlighted this well. It's a really great way to close off our talks. That social justice should be a part of not just acknowledging all these superficial acknowledgements of minoritization, but with a commitment to reducing and dismantling and ending them. There's a question here. Is that the one you were just reading, Shiloh, that says regards to emergency management planning, what would be the one thing you would recommend we do to ensure we are putting in place mitigations to support these vulnerable people in a response that is not currently being done? No, I can't see that one. Thanks. Okay, it's fine. Does anyone want to respond to that from their positions? Um, I think the, the overriding thing for me is actually to go into communities and ask them what they need, to actually sit down and have a cup of tea and cordial with them and say, do you feel like, you know, we're meeting your needs and or how can we best do this? What do you need? And I know, you know, Shiloh, our work for sex workers in Christchurch, that was completely overlooked, like, like. Taika was talking about in the rebuild, they were completely pushed out of the red zone. There was all these unsafe situations that occurred um, in the rebuild. They've been overlooked um, 
and and you know I don't think there's been enough people going how can we best support you however when COVID happened the first organization that the New Zealand government and their um, supporting services went to were NZPC the New Zealand Prostitutes Collective to say can you reach these communities can you make sure that we stay COVID safe and so on and so forth so my one thing is, I guess what you were saying, Shiloh, the relationality. Go in and talk to communities. Don't do what typical researchers do, which is just use them to get to extrapolate data and then move on. Um, and, and it does come to funding. I know that our emergency managers are amazing people. They do amazing work, but they are under-resourced. And they rely, they rely on people within the particular communities actually working with their communities, but they're under-resourced as well. So it's this kind of domino effect. Um, perhaps we need to stop doing so much resource and actually share it with, with the people at the front line. <laughs> I guess also when you're talking to communities as well, they will help you define what's important to them. Otherwise you can assume a lot and you can design all the programs in the world, but they'll be highly mm. ineffective if you're not talking to the communities who are most impacted. Hey, Taika, did you want to talk a little bit about how that has been your experience in trying to def in trying to get this small project off the ground when talking to queer organisations? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can use the example of um, trans and gender diverse people um, in terms of, I do think it really reaffirms that point of we actually need to speak to communities about what their priorities are, because oftentimes, again, yeah, we're designing interventions which for at least certain uh, communities within these communities, they're completely not the priority whatsoever. So I think particularly when we talk around issues of sexuality or gender, we start thinking um, almost to tunnel vision within those ideas of that. Okay, so trans people, what might they want in a disaster is something to do with their transness. Um, whereas I found talking, um, because that is my community within this space, that actually um, even simple things like having a place to go um, during COVID or a disaster is a priority, and that it isn't all linked to their gender identity. But the moment we're putting them under that categorization, oftentimes that becomes our one focus is that this community must want this one thing. Um, and it's, it's the same kind of things even in a lot of these organizations which are trying to do this work. Um, for them, often a lot of times to get funding to do this work, they have to buy into that narrative as well of like, this is what um, these people want and, you know, often frame through a way which the government is going to be more willing to uh, fund it. So I definitely think, and that adds uh, complications to this, so is, yeah, actually asking these communities, what is your priority in a disaster? Not assuming that it's something silly like um, access to gender affirming care or something like that. While that's a massive priority, it's probably subsumed with the more immediate needs in a disaster of we simply don't have a safe space to go to or you know if you're couch surfing what happens if a landlord comes and um like uh susses out that property and finds that you're breaking the lease by having these people couch surfing so again oftentimes the more we actually speak to these populations these communities um, we start to realise that their lived experience is way more nuanced than we think it is. And mm -hmm. sometimes their social positionings or identities, actually, while it's incredibly important, it isn't your focus in the moment. Um, so I think that's a big thing to sort of reaffirm as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for that. Oh, no. Am I missing any other questions, guys? I think that's it. Can't see any more. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Shiloh, for handling that so um, superbly. Right, so I will just um, say thank you once again to our research team for your amazing presentations and your really thoughtful responses and commentary. Um, to Shiloh and Denise, nga mihi nui ki koroa. Thank you for your mahi and your leadership in this space and for your mentorship of these really fabulous emerging researchers. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us today. I hope you gained some insights that you can take away and incorporate into your mahi um, or even um, to help you start some conversations uh, with colleagues and communities you're working with.
I'm sure our researchers are happy to continue these conversations if further questions occur to you. Um, before I close us out with a cut of care, I will just give a really quick plug for a webinar we are hosting next Tuesday on the Kopapa of earthquake prone marae and whānau based solutions. Um, our webinars are usually monthly, but we've got a bit out of sync due to COVID disruptions. Um, so that webinar will be led by Professor Reagan Potangaroa of Massey University with representatives from um, marae communities he's working with and you can find more information on our website. Um, so I will close with a karakia. Kia whakaerea te tapu, kia wātia ai te ara, kia tūruki whakataha ai, kia tūruki whakataha ai, haumie, huie, taia kie. Kia pai tō koutou ahi ahi, Kaki te anon.